I don't know if I were spending one point five million dollars, I'd want to be sure of where I'm yeah. going. But um, that's me. What's up, you scholars of enlightenment? Dr. Sam Gregson, particle physicist here again. I hope you've had a brilliant week and have exciting plans for the weekend. Now, this week, we're going to be catching up on all the latest studies into Professor Avi Loeb's allegedly cosmic spherules. Last year, Harvard astronomer Loeb made the sensational claim that an extrasolar interstellar meteor hit the Earth near Papua New Guinea in 2014 and that he and his team had managed to retrieve fragments from that interstellar impactor by dragging a magnetic sled along the sea floor. Loeb has further claimed that the fragments could be part of an extraterrestrial probe or could have been part of the crust of a planet in a far-flung solar system beyond our own. On the 12th of March, Loeb's claims got their first airing with the broader scientific community at the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference in the Woodlands, Texas. Most domain experts were seemingly not convinced. To help me understand why the scientific community isn't celebrating the retrieval and analysis of interstellar meteorite fragments, I'm joined by a brilliant special guest, Professor Steve Desch. Professor Desch is an astrophysicist in the School of Earth and Space Exploration at Arizona State University. His research focuses on developing models of stars and planet formation using data from meteoritics and planetary science. He especially studies the origins of chondrules and meteorites, and he also works in the fields of exoplanets and astrobiology, and is principal investigator on the NASA-funded NEXSS grant to study geochemical cycles on exoplanets and to aid in searches for signs of life on those planets. Asteroid 9926-DESH is named after him. So I couldn't hope for a better special guest to help me dig into the latest brouhaha around Loeb's cosmic spherules. So Steve, before we get into the weeds of these uh, latest findings, what was the response to uh, Professor Loeb's claims um, that he recovered interstellar spherules at the recent Lunar and Planetary Science Conference in Texas? I, I know you can't obviously speak for the entire community, but, but what was your sense of the reaction? Was there a consensus on, on these findings? Well, to be fair, the abstract that was submitted, uh, it had Loeb as the first author, but it was to be delivered by Stein Jacobson, who is the isotopic cosmic chemist at Harvard, who actually measured the abundances. Mm -hmm. And that abstract, the research notes on AAAS, um, and, and which has also been posted on archive, they're all backing off of the explicit claim that these are okay. uh, interstellar in origin. So there's a little bit of a disconnect between the media that we're seeing and the, the scientific claims that are being made. Uh, that's right. It seems like the science is being done more by real scientists and uh, is a little bit more measured. Um, it's hanging out there that they believe strongly that these all came from one meteor and it's hanging out there that they believe that that meteor is interstellar. But uh, for the purposes of the meeting, the abstract, uh, the claim was simply that uh, the spherules were very different compositionally okay. than anything else that, that we've ever seen. Okay, so inviting comment and inviting people to, uh, to look into maybe where they come from, which is some of the work you've done. So let's get into that. So I wanna start with the idea that, that this is interstellar and we discussed this previously. So I'm gonna um, invite people to look at the, the video that will pop up on screen as well, because we don't want to recover all of that ground. But this idea that this, um, this meteor was interstellar. What what data is Loeb relying on uh, for this claim that this meteor streaking across the skies in Papua New Guinea was interstellar? Because that's going to be important when we look at your your work, um, your new work on this issue. Right. What data did he rely on? Um, when should we ask him? <laughs> because I think that matters. <laughs> What? Okay, let me rephrase. What data is he saying that he's relying on? Yeah, maybe that's, exactly. uh, maybe that's uh, uh, a better way. Okay, so first, there's the CNEOS database, mm. which is populated with data that is given to uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory based on um, U.S. government sensors. These are... Uh, These are space-based, right? These are... Yes, cameras on satellites okay. that orbit the Earth, and most of them are doing classified work. They are 
probably looking for rocket launches or mm -hmm. other blasts, et cetera. Yeah. And uh, some of them are from weather satellites. And uh, there we do know the capabilities, but the capabilities of the spy satellites, we, we don't know. Of course. Yeah. And we also, um, we don't know the, the veracity of the data. Uh, we can't check it. There's no raw data. There's no error bars associated with any of this data. And so um, there is that database. And I can talk more about that. And then there is uh, his own uh, attempts to localize mm. the meter using seismological data, which uh, he he really did try uh, to do that. And I can I can talk I about think, that. I think we're going to get into both of those. So so yeah. I think the there's there's those two kinds of data, like you said. There's these um, these sensors which are on satellites in space, which are held by the the U.S. government, NASA little difficult, well, very difficult to get at the raw data of that. And also some work that he's done with with local um, seismological and uh, infrastructure data. So what what are the what are the issues with using that data? So you mentioned there the, the CN EOS data. Why? Mm -hmm. So so Loeb kind of leans on this and he says, look, we can we can get the speed of this object. It's definitely interstellar. We can get very, very fine um, details about where this thing landed, you know, within tiny fractions of a degree. Why is that not necessarily a, a, an acceptable mm. thing for him to be saying? Or, or at least, right, why is that not something that it, we can be sure of? It's simply not a reliable database. Okay. And it's very clear that uh, after the debacle of Oumuamua, um, no longer appearing to be, although it is interstellar, it's no longer uh, interesting as a uh, you know, a, a solar sail or other technological thing. It's a chunk of ice is what it is. Uh, after that, he he was um, very motivated to find examples of interstellar objects he could get his hands on. And so having Which discovered- Which is an interesting field, right? It's an interesting thing to try and do, but you have to do it, you know, as, uh, as carefully as possible. Yes, um, I agree. This would be, uh, you know, revolutionary if we could, have actual samples from another solar system, mm -hmm. their isotopes measure their elemental abundances, even if it is just a piece of rock, mm -hmm. that would tell us quite a lot about mm -hmm. how solar systems form. It would tell us a lot about the uh, propensity of solar systems to form Earth-like planets and uh, planets that could host life forms mm -hmm. like us. It's very important data to have. Uh, so it's not it, something that the community doesn't want or is not interested oh in exploring. It, they, they, they desperately want this uh, this data. You know, meteor studiers, uh, you know, people who study the, the meteors and their trajectories, uh, they have been looking for interstellar meteors for almost a century. Mm. And since the birth of the field, uh, there was this um, acceptance of the idea oh. that many meteors must have come from outside of mm. the solar system. But the problem is that as the decades went on and the data became more precise, uh, people realized that very few meteors are coming from outside the solar system. And, uh, you know, it went from being something like maybe maybe most to maybe only 10 percent to maybe one percent, <laughs> maybe one in a thousand. And I think we're at like one in a hundred thousand mm. or less uh, of all meteors must be coming from outside the solar system, which does not mean that that it's going to converge to zero. Yeah. We do expect some meteors to come from outside the solar system. But what that history of the field has taught us is that uh, we can easily be tricked by imprecise yeah. data and you have to be very careful. Yeah. And when you are looking for uh, actual material, uh, there's there's almost like a uh, a chain of custody of the evidence. You know, you have to be sure that that, that meteor is indeed interstellar and it, you have to be sure you know that a lot of it survived entry through our atmosphere and you have to know exactly where it fell and you have to know when you collect it if it's different from other things that are in that vicinity and yeah. that it is uniquely identifiable, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's And I think in our last discussion, again, I'll flag that up on the screen. I think we discussed that that none of those uh, steps in that in that chain of custody of evidence, as you said, have really be, are on are on solid footing. They sure aren't. Yeah. So it, I have the impression that they found this object in the database. They said, "Bingo, uh, <laughs> it is uh, interstellar." And indeed, if the velocities and other data that are reported in the catalog are correct, then it would be interstellar it was moving at 45 kilometers a second uh, according to the database in a direction that would mean that its velocity relative to the sun 
was too fast for it to stay in orbit around the sun and yeah. therefore it didn't start in orbit around the sun. Yeah. So um, that would be the case. I see up on your screen is, uh, you know, one of the key papers in this mm -hmm. field, but not the only one that looked at meteors from the ground and found, uh, you know, they have a network of cameras that are all pointing in different directions. And when multiple cameras see the meteor, they can triangulate and get its exact position um, with very high precision. And you can compare that for those cases uh, where the meteor was observed from the ground and are, is also in the CNRS uh, database, you can compare those two. And that's what this paper did and found that half the time, you know, the, the velocities matched well enough, um, but a, a full third of the time they, they matched so poorly that you could hardly say they were on the same orbit. In one extreme case, uh, the, the camera network saw the meteor was going this way when the catalog, the scenery database would say it's going this way, yeah. 90 degrees different. So uh, it's not a very reliable database and uh, multiple uh, attempts to compare from the ground have, have found the same thing. It's, it's, it's wrong, like very wrong, uh, at least a third of the time. So, so we have reason. So, so this is not to say that this is definitely wrong data, but we have reason to suspect that it possibly is wrong, and therefore we need independent verification. We need to see the raw data. We need to check it. You can't just trust in this database and say this thing is definitely interstellar. That that's not an appropriate thing to do. Is that is that a fair summary? Yeah, that's a fair summary, um, and that seems to be at the the nub of uh, Loeb's defense right now. Is that you don't don't know that we went to the wrong place um but that's flipped that's flipped the wrong way around for science right? yeah. <laughs> i don't know if i were spending 1.5 million dollars i'd want to be sure of where i'm yeah. going but um that's me well when it's not your money it's maybe a little bit easier it's not my money <laughs> right so it's so okay it's a very unreliable database is is the truth and yeah you do yeah. need to uh to verify it with other things and let me point out one other real oddity Please. about the database there are two locations. So we talked about the velocities. Hmm. Uh, that would be important for pinning down where this material fell. And uh, that depends on where where the main burst happened. So when uh, the meteor goes through the atmosphere, there reaches a point where it's plowing through so much atmosphere that the, the pressure on the front of the meteor is uh, stronger than the crushing strength or hmm. the tensile strength of the meteor. And it breaks apart. Okay. And... Uh, when it breaks apart, it doesn't explode. I think this is um, a misconception that has appeared in some of Loeb's papers. It doesn't explode at high velocity. It merely disintegrates. But each piece now is moving with the same speed mm -hmm. the meteor was moving, uh, but now with a lot more surface area. And so it dissipates all of that um, heat as friction very quickly. And within less than a second, almost all of the kinetic energy was uh, dissipated in the atmosphere. So... From the standpoint of the meteors, it really doesn't matter if it's one piece or, or several pieces. But um, well, to some extent, when it when it breaks up, it does, um, you know, have uh, less mass per surface area, and so it um, it tends to slow down more immediately. So, is what you're kind but, of saying here is you can't you can't trace that vector down to the ocean surface? Is that what you're kind of getting at, or? Oh well, well I'm getting there, but yeah, it 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 breaks up and it um, it generates a lot of heat in the atmosphere in um, one place. Except that this was actually in three distinct um, disintegration okay. events, uh, separated between the first and last by 0.3 seconds, and that if it were moving um, at 45 kilometers a second at that time, those would be uh, over a length of 15 kilometers, and yeah, that makes it hard to know are the are the uh, stones uh, coming from the first event, the second event, or the third event, and that will make a difference of up to 15 kilometers in where you look. That's well, one thing to keep. That's in before mind. you get into ocean currents and things, I guess. What when yeah. it's hit the surface? <laughs> no, it's going to be dispersed over a large mm. area. Most strewn fields of meteors are kilometers wide, tens of kilometers long. Um, so it's it's several tens of square kilometers at least over which this material will be deposited. It's it's not like you'll find one mother load. But in addition, where did that burst happen? And uh, there are latitude and longitude coordinates on the CNUS website. So this is the main part of the catalog. And as you see from um, left to right, it's reporting 
the time at which it was uh, brightest, the peak brightness, this is when it's actually uh, uh, disrupting. And the exact time to the second, um, 1705.34, it's the latitude and longitude uh, where this is reported to have happened. Mm. And of course, the reporting has been um, rounded down to the nearest tenth of a degree. Yeah. So there's a plus or minus 0 0.05 degrees that, yep. uh, that's implicit in there. There's the altitude at which it broke up, um, and then the velocity, the total speed relative to Earth, 44.8 kilometers per second, yep. and the components of uh, its velocity with respect to Earth in a frame where the x-axis is from the Earth center through zero degrees longitude, zero degrees latitude, right. um, and the z-axis goes through the North Pole. So as you can see, it was... Um, so a lot, a lot of moving, a lot of moving pieces. A lot of, yeah, there's a lot of uh, data to, to digest here. And then finally, there's the total radiated energy. How many joules of energy uh, are presumed to have been irradiated? That's based on a um, how much was actually detected by the sensors, plus some sort of model about what fraction of the radiated mm -hmm. energy would be detected by, by the sensors. And then there's an empirical formula for turning how much uh, radiated energy there was into the actual kinetic energy yeah. that was dissipated. And that is in uh, kilotons of TNT equivalent. Um, and just before we leave this page, you know, there's no air bars associated with any <laughs> of the, reported for any of these things. Yeah. Uh, I, I said that the latitude and longitude can be presumed to be plus or minus 0 0.05 degrees, but that's a presumption. Yeah. The velocities, uh, honestly, at this speed, uh, you know, they're only on a few pixels of any camera, you know, probably, and therefore, you should probably associate eight kilometers a second as the uh, plus or minus air on each component of the velocity. And as you can Which see, it's like twenty percent here or something. Something. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it begins to really add up. Um, the total radiated energy is probably a pretty sound uh, quantity, um, but it does matter uh, to some extent how fast it's going. The calculated impact energy is probably good to within factors of uh, two or three mm. because that empirical formula is just a fit to a lot of things. To so like that, past data of, of things, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And even if you read the formula for how they calculate that, it, it comes with errors um, yeah. that are at least plus or minus a factor of two. So, all right. This is almost certainly what Loeb saw on the database and probably the only part he looked at uh, because it is the first thing you see and it gives him the answer he wants to see and he doesn't look further. So now um, if you go back up yeah. and instead of um, under the fireballs heading, instead of clicking map data, click on light curves. So whereabouts is that? So I go back up and instead of um, fireball map data, I go to light curves. Yeah. Yeah. So click on that and then you'll see the same things advanced to screen. Um, so if I go for 2014 again, again. Yeah. So if I nip through for 2014. On one degree on south. It is um, screen 28. Screen 28. Here we are, I think, this one. 1 1.3 south. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Um, now, click on display download. Display download. On the uh, right side there. Ah, right. yes. I got you. Yeah. And this is the light curve. Right. Can make so that a bit bigger. The, a graph of how bright the meteor was uh, every second. And as you can see, uh, there's three bursts, boom, 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 that took place within the span of 0.3 seconds. And if you look at the, the top, though, uh, it's reporting that it fell um, at 1705.34. That's the same time that's on the other screen to the second. The location of the flash was 1.2 degrees south, 147.1 degrees east, which is off by 0.1 degrees in latitude and 0.5 degrees in longitude. So there are two sites that are um, listed, and there's no explanation for why these differ. 
and Loeb had never made reference to this other location mm. um, before this week. So let's just pause there. Those two locations are 57 kilometers apart. Now, Loeb has since put something quickly up on archive that claims that, well, this records the initial flash and the other data point records the peak brightness. And that is something that one could infer from the wording on this page um, and the other one. But as I tweeted this weekend, you know, when you look at other uh, meteors, especially ones like Chelyabinsk, that had a, a very, you know, long time between when it was first detected and when it was at its peak brightness, um, there is no difference between those two numbers. Uh, it, both the peak brightness and the entry flash are reported to be at the same latitude mm -hmm. and longitude, even though they would be seven to 11 seconds apart. And, uh, you know, here we have, uh, um, and if you wanna play those games, if you wanna say that the other latitude longitude is the entry flash, um, and this one is the bright peak brightness, those two things are separated by um, you know 57 kilometers and they should be one second apart, but they're listed as the same time. Hmm. So that doesn't make sense. Um, and as you can see from this light curve, it was not detected um, you know, 1.5 seconds before the burst. The peak brightness took place a little after you know, half a second here or so um, in this time frame. We don't know what the um, zero time is here. Yeah, yeah. But, but uh, if you want to say it was initially detected, um, you know, and then uh, at the other coordinates and then it was um, peak brightness was here, you have to look back one and a half seconds from that point. It's actually off the chart here, but... Yeah. You know, there's no indication that there was any detection um, before 0.3 seconds on this on this scale. So uh, that strikes me as grasping at straws. Uh, it's it's um, attributing some sort of meaning to these mm. uh, data points that I don't think is even implied and wouldn't work if it were true. The, basically, the database is full of little errors like this. Mm. You know, the, the locations are not exactly uh, what they say they are. They are not, um, you know, exactly the um, velocities. And this, is, and this is something, Steve, that someone who works with this database like yourself constantly would know, right? But someone who potentially doesn't may not know or, or understand these potential sources of error. That's exactly right. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so I guess the impact of all this... Um, is it fair to say, Steve, that the impact is that regarding the retrieval of any interstellar material, if your sensor data is, is not reliable, you can't you can't be sure of the uncertainties on those on that sensor data, then we can't be sure that, first of all, this IM1 meteor was interstellar. And furthermore, we can't be exactly sure where it impacted the ocean and therefore where we need to go looking. Is that is that exactly the option? those are exactly the two points, I think. When so, to draw. Yeah. so how did how did Professor Loeb try to get around this these limitations? So we talked about the CNEOS database. Um, how did he try to constrain or at least confirm that the the CNEOS data was accurate and, and and where to go looking? How did he how did he try and work around that? Because I think he talked about some some seismic data to try and um, nail down right. his position where he went looking. Yeah, I think it would be better to look at um, the figure from Loeb's paper um, itself at this point. Sure. Um, so uh, this red box, the middle red box, I believe corresponds to the one set of coordinates, which is uh, on the main web uh, page, uh, the main page on the CNEOS website. So that would be the 1.3 degrees south. Uh, at the center of the box and 147.6 degrees east. And the box is 11 kilometers on a side, denoting the uncertainty of you know, 0.05 mm -hmm. uh, degrees uh, in the position. And so they're they're quite certain because- That they, they covered the red box, basically going yeah. around all over the place, yeah. 
Well, there's they're very certain that the the red box must have been right because they didn't look for the you know any other coordinates on the website, and uh, those other coordinates would be 57 degrees to I'm sorry 57 kilometers to the uh, west, and they would be quite off this chart. Right. You know, so that other set of coordinates is right. They look nowhere near where right. the meteor uh, actually disrupted, and so they're putting a lot of faith in in that one set of numbers. Um, but in fact, the numbers on the PDF are probably the ones that the Department of Defense originally reported because uh, presumably the Department of Defense makes the light curve and makes the PDF. Although right. uh, again, none of this is clear. It's yeah. opaque. But this, but, but this is, the, but this is enough. It it doesn't have to be clear. You you have to prove this. You have to make it clear to the scientific community. Right there, there is a problem here with with having that certainty. Absolutely. There's a burden of proof and it's yeah, on them exactly, exactly. Uh, to demonstrate that, you know, they've maintained that chain of custody, if you will. Um, and I would think, you know, if if um, if you're uh, going to look for a treasure that your map, you know what where the exit. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, um, they're pretty sure that it's in that box. And what they tried to do beyond that. Yeah. Is use the seismic signal to pin yes. down where in the box they look because it's actually hard to systematically search that entire red box and so that orange... so there's a bunch of seismograph stations around this area yes. because it's highly seismologically active and i think there was one at is, is it manis island which they which they yes. tried to use and maybe i can bring up a nice little plot here and you can uh, you can talk again. exactly so now it must be stated that i think um, not all of these were active in 2014. Right. Even if they are now. Uh, the Manus Island one is the one near that red uh, arrow, which is supposed to be the uh, velocity mm. and position of, of the meteor. Uh, it's about 90 kilometers or so from, um, you know, the meteor is somewhere around 90 kilometers from the um from the from the island in the seismometer. Yeah. In addition, there's another one um, labeled Cohen um, that is in northern Australia, and that might also give a signal. However, the sound waves from the meteor would have to go over the mountain range in Papua New Guinea, right. the island between, which is improbable. And then, in addition, there's these uh, two red ones which are a different network. It's uh, not so much a seismological network as um, detectors associated with the uh, comprehensive, um, uh, you know, the band, the, the treaty, treaty um, checking. So In infrasound for uh, nuclear, uh, exactly. clandestine nuclear tests and things like this. Exactly. So, um, and there are actually many more of those, but what Loeb, Siraj and Loeb did in a paper that somehow uh, got published in uh, a journal. I am not aware of this journal. I don't think any scientist I've talked to is aware of this journal. Even seismologists have never heard of signals. Um, but anyway, what they reported was that they thought they saw the signal at um, both of those blue seismometers. And I don't believe there was a signal at the the other blue one there, or it probably wasn't active at the time. So um, if you believe that you have uh, seen the signal of the meteor uh, arrive at the seismograph on Manus Island, and if you know how fast the sound wave um, propagates, and if you know the time it took to reach the seismometer, then one could basically multiply time by velocity to get the distance. And that's what that orange curve in the other um, the map is. And it's worth looking at that map. Right. So, you know, they basically uh, thought that they could pin down the distance between the seismometer on Manus Island and the meteor to within a kilometer. Mm -hmm. And if could do that, then you might um, reduce the uncertainty to a, a very narrow strip. Mm -hmm. That's what that orange region is supposed mm -hmm. to be. Now, clearly, you know, we don't know the direction. Uh, they didn't know the direction, I should say. And so uh, all they could do is draw a circle around the Manus Island seismometer. And if you were to extend that orange curve, you know, it would go. Yeah, it's an arc of a circle. Yeah. Yeah. 
but um, they believed that they could pin it down to less than one kilometer width. Um, uh, the other seismometer was more uncertain, and, and so you couldn't pin it down to less than the size of this box, but here they thought that they could um, pin it down to the size of the box. Now, there's many problems with doing this. Well, presumably, yeah. you could still be off on the right or the left of the arc, right? You, you're you not triangulating it. You're just you're just getting a distance. So at best, you're, right. you're, you're kind of validating one one direction, one component. But Sam, you you lack confidence. If you have a lot of confidence that <laughs> that box is the right box, and there's nothing okay. that any government agent has ever been mistaken about, and if you're confident in your ability to find a distance of some spurious signal to the to the meteor, then uh, then you're going to be very confident about where to send the boat. Okay. Yeah, have confidence. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I'm a scientist. I'm not allowed. So. Uh... Okay, exactly. so so we got so we got some problems here, right? We're only using one one seismometer. Or, or I guess they yeah. they say they use two, but we're not sure that there was even a signal in the second one. So you you can't triangulate anything here. And I think in your new work with um with Ben Fernando, mm -hmm. you even questioned whether this signal comes from um the meteor before, at all. Before, before we before leave we that, Matt, can I point out one thing. Of course, please. So, after the fact. Yeah, go back to that map. Okay, After yeah. the fact, um, Loeb has stated that they didn't use seismic data to know where to look. They used Department of Defense data. The Department. So, so, so there's something funny going on here because it, it, the 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 main data that he claims to use is the CNUS data, and then he's using this to to validate that. But then when this kind of falls apart or people make questions about this, he just falls back to the CNUS data. So that seems to be the one that is to him unfallible and you know whatever you exactly. say you can mess with these seismometers and you can you can say that this box is a load of or the the orange ring is a yellow is a load of nonsense but at the end of the day the military says that i'm right and therefore end of discussion seems to be the right and so ignoring again that the military told him to look in two places and he did not look at one place where where is all the search in the um the northeast corner of that red box Yes, because if you are following the Department of Defense data and you figure it's somewhere in that red box, um, if you're not using your own seismic data to localize it, you would search the whole box. Yeah. So clearly they used their own seismic data <laughs> yeah. to tell them where to search. Yeah. That's an out, out lie that they didn't use their own data. Yeah. To, to it, know it, it certainly looks like it. It certainly looks like it, doesn't it? They left half of the 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 field here. So so under. so so what so what you're getting at here, Steve? If if I can translate this for for the viewers in a simple way, and please tell me if I'm wrong, is that even if you accept that those that CNUS data is is extremely accurate, there's still some level uncertainty of it, and, and even the uncertainty that they've quoted with this red box, they they haven't even covered that area. So even within their own claims, they haven't. They haven't covered up the entire area that they should have. Yep. They left half of it unsearched because they were very certain about this seismic signal. Okay, which is a problem. Yeah. Right, let's move on to that. Right. So, so you mentioned that that you know we're only using one direction, which is which is certainly problematic. We would have liked to get triangulation of this, but but Loeb is claiming the triangulation comes from the CNUS data. Okay, so let's let's park that. We talked about the problems with that, but let's park that. Another exactly. problem seems to be that you don't think this is even from the meteor. You, you got another point there, Steve. Yeah, it's it's not necessarily true that you cannot tell uh, where something happened with one seismometer. Um, it is possible to use one seismometer. Uh, but what you need to do with one seismometer is break apart the signal into okay. uh, the various up, down, east, west, north, south vibrations and basically get the polarization right. of the sound wave. And if you have the polarization of the sound wave and you know that the different polarizations travel at different you know, velocities, it is actually possible okay. to figure out not only um, distance, but uh, direction. And that's actually important for what Ben's gonna do, but it's very difficult to take seismometer data and convert it into the three components of the vibration. And certainly 
uh, Siraj and Loeb had no clue to do that, let alone how to do that. Um, and this is something that Ben and colleagues do for a living, and it still was quite an effort to do. Good stuff. So let's talk about, so they, they, they have looked at that data, yourself and Ben and others. And right. what do we, so what do we see in this data? Work. Why are we, why are we even less convinced that we're, we're seeing, um, Loeb's meteor in this data? Right. So where is, uh, the purported signal here? I'm, I'm trying to look on your screen and, um, it's very hard, but Maybe to make it a little bit, I can, I can boost this up for you. Yeah, across. it's even better to, um, you know, to look at, <laughs> we'll keep this up, but it's better to look at, at Loeb's data because it shows just how, uh, even even with the data they were looking at, um, how, how poorly they were working with the data. But basically, as you can see, this is, um, this is the seismic signal uh, over the course of a day, right. and it has been broken apart into the different um, uh, directions of vibration, the up and down vibration, the um, north south vibration and the east west vibration. So this is from Ben's paper. He was able to uh, break apart the different um, velocities. And these are of the ground, you know, microns per second velocities of the ground moving up and down or side to side. And as you can see throughout the day, it's noisy. It's you pretty, know, messy, on the pretty messy down there. Yeah, on the level that, um, you know, the vibration that we're looking at somewhere in that red box is is where um, the signal that, yeah, I think at the red um, dash line, is that, that, it's hard for me to tell, but these are, these are the types of signals they're seeing. And as you can see, there's plenty of signals throughout the day. And in fact, there's a lot of them during daylight hours and not so many during the nighttime hours. And the um, the forms of the sound waves or the vibrations here um, kind of reinforce the story that you're looking at human truck traffic. You know, there's a road near where this seismograph is and trucks go up and down this road, mostly in the day and sometimes at night. And um, and that's mostly what you're seeing, because this, this is not 100 interstellar meteors falling near the <laughs> seismograph. <laughs> If only, so, if only, Steve, if only. <laughs> yeah, the fleet did not land here. Yeah. So, uh, so yes, yeah, now if we zoom in on the signal that the um, Siraj and Loeb picked up on, you know, this is the few um, minutes or hours around the time. And as you can see, uh, yeah, I think it's the the one on the, with the dashed line at 110 local time. Yeah. Or so, yeah. So that's the signal they said. Oh, that's the that's the interstellar meteor, and there's nothing about that signal that says this is weird compared to all of the hundreds of other signals. There's nothing about it um, mm -hmm. at all that suggests it's coming from off the island. The only aspect that signal has is that it appeared at the time they wanted it to be. They basically so said, it's, so it's circular reasoning, essentially. It's circular reasoning. They looked at the box uh, where the, they said the DOD told them to look. They figured it would take about, um, you know, uh, so many seconds, you know, um, something like, let's see, if it's 90 kilometers away, something about 30 seconds or so for the signal to arrive. They looked at about 30 seconds after the um you know, the, the meteor uh, arrived and they found a signal at around that time. And there's also a signal like it five minutes before that time. <laughs> and there's also a signal like that half an hour after that yeah. time. And there's nothing about that, that that indicates that it's from the meteor at all. Yeah, and we see a lot of signals like that suggesting it could could be again. We need to prove mm -hmm. that it's that it's definitely this interstellar meteor, but it could just be noise from from a truck rumbling along the road nearby. There's so we we've, we've spent a lot of effort, um, you know, tr emphasizing that even if that were the signal of the meteor, by the way, even if it were, there's a lot of uncertainties about the sound speed. Yeah. Uh, if you want to say that you can pin down to within one kilometer where uh, that meteor hit, you're saying basically you can pin down the distance to within 1%. Hmm. 
Right. And that means that you've pinned down the um, sound speed to within 1%. And it's not a simple thing to do. Uh, the sound speed varies because of temperature. It um, will vary as a function of height. The sound is not going in a straight line, by the way. It is being refracted by the atmosphere. It spends most of its time propagating through the stratosphere before it is ducted down to Earth and so on. And if um, it, there's no way to pin down the distance of a sound wave to less than um, you know three seconds, like they're saying, uh, it is it is. Oh, right. 300 seconds. Sorry. That's how long it would take five minutes to get there. So, yeah, there's absolutely no way to to pin it down to that sort of precision and get an orange curve that is that thin. It is even the best modelers doing um, analysis of <laughs> where you know when the explosion happened and you know where it happened. You cannot pin it down. Uh, to a box, you know, smaller than that, that DOD box in the first mm -hmm. place. So, and especially hard when you haven't even seen the signal of the meteor. So we're not sure we've even seen the signal of the meteor. We're only using one seismometer, potentially not breaking down the signals very well. And I think some of the, some of the work that you, Ben and yourself did, you also looked at some of these other stations, these infrasound stations, um, right. and said that, you know, the, you can only pin this down with a with a low level of accuracy. Now, now Loeb has picked back, pushed back on this, and obviously said, you know, the the the, the white ring that you put is a ninety percent confidence level, and the CNUS positions right. are, are are in that book. So, what's your problem? So, what are we? Uh, what two are we issues. Here? Yeah, I mean, for one thing, that's a distraction. Um, it is possible to use seismographs that actually did pick up the signal of the meteor as these did, these three actually did pick up the signal of the meteor and uh, they can pin down where it took place and it doesn't look like it's near there, but it it, it, it could encompass that. But mm. let me get back to that. That's a distraction. The fact is they did not pick up the signal of the meteor. And so they have no idea how far it was from Annis Island. They have no idea where to draw that orange line, mm. let alone have a line that is, you know, one kilometer thick. Yeah, there is absolutely no way that they know where to draw that radius. It's going to be um, basically this entire map is in the orange zone. <laughs> um, even if they had picked up the signal of the meteor, which they didn't. <laughs> so they, they can't pin it down to within uh, anywhere inside the DOD box. They have absolutely no localization data. None. Right? That should be that should be addressed first. Right. They have no way to localize it. Right. So that so they really are <laughs> resting on this DOD data and, and pretty much nothing else. So the only the only um piece of evidence that they looked in the right place is that they looked where the DOD told them. Mm. But of course, they went to only one of the two locations yep. that the DOD told them, and yep. then they only searched half that area. Yeah. Okay. So even within that, even if the even if that data is absolutely hundred percent accurate, there are still a couple of problems with that, and and very absolutely. important problems. And then um, going back to to Ben's map, um, this is to say, if you were to analyze the data correctly, <laughs> you could you know, pull in this other seismograph data, you could figure out where it occurred and uh, you would find this large um, air ellipse. Mm. Uh, and this is a conservative um, estimate of, of where it mm. could be. So yeah, there is a chance that they looked in the place the meteor <laughs> fell, but it's also not a very good chance. Yeah. And they again, the burden of proof is on on them to, to to prove that they really did look in the right place. So, so I guess the upshot of all this is, if we go through your your custody of data, we can't be certain this thing was interstellar because we we haven't seen the the data. We haven't interrogated that data from the the DoD. We're not exactly sure where this thing um, landed, so we don't exactly know where to look. Um, so a whole host of problems now. Avi Loeb has, has pushed back on some of these claims, and, and I think we've we've covered a, a a couple of those. So maybe if I ask you to respond to some of his counterpoints. So the first yeah. counterpoint is is kind of 
I guess it's more of just a dig. So he said, this press release, so talking about Ben's work, and I guess you were involved with the work, this press release is by people who did not do any work. They did not collect materials. They did not analyse anything. They just sit on their chairs and express their opinions. Um, and he put this in a blog post, which he called Scientific Misinformation, about a New York Times piece which covered um, Fernando's work and work that you were involved with. So how do you respond to that? That sounds to me like a just a definition of peer review, to be fair. People who sit on their chairs and express their opinions. <laughs> um, yeah, well, Loeb engages in a lot of projection. It's very clear that Ben uh, Fernando and his colleagues did more work and did more analysis of seismic data than Loeb did. Let's just be fair. This was not easy. Making this graph, finding, collecting the data, translating the, uh, the data in these different formats into an actual, this is how fast the ground was moving. Mm -hmm. And therefore also, this is how far and what direction it is to make a graph like this uh, is not trivial. Mm -hmm. This is a lot of work and it's also not Ben's day job. So the fact that um, it was done at all uh, is, is quite a testament to, um, you know, their dedication to setting the record straight. But uh, yeah, this is not easy. This is not something you sit in your chair and you pontificate mm -hmm. about and then um, write something quickly and put on a blog. This took months of work. And all of the um, all of the other claims, you know, that are refuted, are those refutations are, are um, based on months of work. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. um, it is very clear, though, that Loeb, you know, just quickly, very sloppily put stuff up there. I don't think he got out of his chair when he wrote this paper, <laughs> his papers. Um, and he's, he, I don't know what to say about that. The other thing is, uh, as as you'll see when I talk about the spherules, is they've put data online. They have put um, the compositions that they've measured of the spherules online. And I think he's uh, upset that people are looking at that data and interpreting it differently through different models that also are not easy to do. Mm. And I have to ask, um, fine, I didn't collect that data. Are you saying I shouldn't trust the data and analyze it? Are you saying it's wrong? <laughs> I mean, you know, peer reviewers don't collect the data. I mean, in my experience, they, they're peer reviewers, right? They they peer yeah. review the work. That's the definition of peer review. So, uh, I mean, that first one's just just a dig, to be fair. So, I mean, okay, fine. Um, and then, the, I mean, I guess we've covered some of the other pushback. So, uh, mentioning that this graph we've seen on the screen or this um, this box that we've seen on the screen is only a 90% confidence interval. So, the points are in here. But as you've said, he hasn't nailed that down. And the burden of proof is on him to to, to prove that it is at this position inside this, this white box. And then I think... I think the major pushback, um, and again, we've already we've already covered it, is that he's just saying that the CNEOS data is accurate. And uh, what he uh, the quote that he said on that was um, the astronomers who dismiss this satellite data and argue that it must be entirely wrong, which I don't think you're doing, but, you know, could be wrong should lose sleep at night because their mistrust implies that their safety is not secured and their taxes are wasted on an unreliable national security infrastructure. So how do you feel about that, Steve? Are you, uh, do you stay awake <laughs> at night worrying about the Russian missiles coming because you can't pin down this meteor correctly? It's, it's really precious how he conflates uh, our, our nuclear infrastructure and the Department of Defense with this one little catalog, which is barely an afterthought to the military. Um, the military doesn't really care about this database. They, they supply JPL with information at their convenience and discretion. Uh, they obviously do not care about the accuracy or precision of the data. It's and demonstrate it to be flawed in other venues. And that doesn't impugn the ability of our, you know, Department of Defense to accurately um, detect missiles or to keep us safe. It's not designed to look for meteors. It's designed to look for rocket launches. And I trust that it does that well. Uh, this database is 
of meteors is not what it was designed to do. And it's not something people dedicate a lot of effort to doing. And the only person who really trusts this database has been Loeb himself. And I think if I were Loeb, I would lose sleep over the idea that perhaps I sent an expensive oceanographic expedition to the wrong location. <laughs> Uh, and as you can see on this map, CNEOS C is is the one location where they searched mm -hmm. the 147.6 east and the 1.3 degrees south. Uh, CNEOS B is that other location, yeah. 1.2 degrees south, 147.1 degree east, which is on the PDF of the light curve, which presumably is the one that the Department of Defense intended for to be in the catalog. And um, it's interesting that that location is is more probable because uh, it's closer to oh, where the okay. yeah, yeah. it than than Senior SC. Um, neither one is uh, nothing. There's nothing definite about any of this. Um, either of those locations could be yeah. where the infrasound uh, or consistent with the infrasound. But um, but he only looked in one place and he only looked in half of that box with no explanation. It's very clear he only this week realized he had made a big mistake <laughs> and is trying to grasp his straws to, to cover it. So before we move on to the, the composition, Steve, because we spent a lot of time on uh, on vectors of seismometers, which is fascinating stuff, but how, how can we get clarity on this issue and nail this this issue down of the location? Then is, is this really just the the DOD releasing that data and letting scientists have a look at it? Is there, is there any hope of uh, that? I mean, I suppose, but... Uh, Satellite data generally is not good enough for uh, this purpose. You know, um, satellite data, you're looking at something from thousands of kilometers away. Um, it's, it's even with the best cameras, you know, there's limits to how accurately uh, you can localize, you know, the, the direction of something. There are pixels have certain sizes. Uh, these things are moving incredibly fast hmm. and it's, it's just very hard to do. So um, I, I really doubt that even if we had our hands on the mm -hmm. satellite data that you could uh, retrieve the information. The only times that uh, objects have been um, you know, seen in space and then recovered has been when there's other ancillary data on the ground, you know, like Doppler radar um, or you know, camera networks or something like that. Um, satellite data alone, especially one satellite, or <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's a fool's errand. So a lot of problems with um, the trajectory, whether this thing was actually interstellar, where we go looking for these things. We talked about that a lot. The measured composition of the spherules also challenges the idea that they're of a, an interstellar origin. So Loeb analyzed these spherules and determined that they were likely of interstellar origin based on the different element and isotope ratios seen inside these samples. However, I believe from, from your studies and studies in the community, um, there's strong evidence that they actually come from the Earth themselves. Um, so not necessarily from outer space, but they're 100% consistent with having a solar system origin and possibly even just a, a terrestrial origin. So... I guess the question is, what are these these spherules? So we've talked before, and again, I'll I'll put people to that um to that discussion because I don't want to to retread old ground. But we've talked about the iron isotope ratios, which give good, uh, very very strong evidence that these spherules come from the solar system. So potentially from space, but at least within the solar system. Loeb has also claimed that the unusual enrichments in beryllium, lanthanum, and uranium in the spherules he collected are inconsistent with a solar system origin and therefore must be interstellar. Now, Steve, I think yourself and Alan Jackson um, had some issues with these in the early knockings and those have only got stronger. So what did what were your concerns with that initially? And then we'll move on to talking about these, this idea of tektites. Yeah, so... Um... First, let's let's talk about the iron isotopes. Sure, we can we can if you want to go for go back. I was going to save you the going over it again, but we can. Yeah, um, you know these are the ratios of how many iron fifty seven atoms there are versus iron fifty four uh, versus iron fifty six to fifty four ratios, and uh, these are a handful of the spherules that they've um, 
actually measured. And the blue and red ones are typical micrometeorites. They identify these as ablation spherules that um, when a meteor, I mean, any meteor, and who knows when those meteors landed any time in the last thousands of years, um, when those meteors are going through the atmosphere, their surfaces melt. If it's an iron meteorite, you have um, iron melt that comes off as little droplets. That's the I-type micrometeorites. And if you have um, rocky ones, uh, the, the rock melt comes off as an S-type. So we've got some, and, some nice pictures here to kind of show people yeah, the things that you get. Exactly. And and so in their sample, they've now analyzed almost 800 um, uh, spherules for their compositions. And they've determined that 78% of them or so are these typical micrometeorites, which you'd expect to find. But they also found a high proportion, 22% that are uh, what they call D-type. And the D-type are um, have very low magnesium, uh, very low magnesium silicon ratios, less than a third, but sometimes very small. And uh, they've further analyzed a subset of those and half of those, and now there's something like 12, uh, have these beryllium, lanthanum, uranium enrichments. Okay, so, um, you can look at the the ratios here. Everything from the solar system is going to fall on that pink line. Yeah. And indeed, the micrometeorites do. And it's the weird spherules, the green ones here, that they're claiming are different uh, because they're part of this 22% of spherules that have very low magnesium silicon ratios. And half of those have really, you know, Enrichments in beryllium, lanthanum, uranium. Enrichments, by the way, relative to what? And that kind of matters. If you compare it to other meteoritic material, they're very enriched in beryllium, lanthanum, uranium, um, which does not mean that they're weird. It just means they would be weird if they were meteorites. Right. Um, but they also fall um, on that pink line, suggesting that they're coming from a solar system source, as you say. But um, all potentially Earth, Earth itself is is on the zero, and most Earth rocks, they're not in that blue box. They're on that pink line in that blue box, and uh, so, you know, so and just to give people a little a little heads up on what's happening here. So when these meteors come through the atmosphere, they they boil off these these iron isotopes. The lighter ones are boiled off um, faster than the the heavier ones, and that means that this kind of um, mass dependent process can move um, the relative fractions of these isotopes up and down this pink line. But of course, if you're coming from inside the solar system and this mass uh, dependent process can move you up and down this line, you you stay on the line. If you were from line. another solar system, you would expect to be on a parallel line, but we're, we're dead on this line. Exactly, yeah. And um, we we then and, and now uh, have made estimates of how far off that line would you be if you were from another solar system, how how far mm -hmm. up would that parallel line be? And as you can see, the units here, minus one, zero, one, two. Um, would it show up on this graph? Oh, my God. Uh, you would be thousands. Right. Okay. You would be at least hundreds, maybe it's thousands. Right. And so it, it would be extremely improbable for another solar system right. to have Just rocks. by chance to have exactly the same. Yeah. 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 There's a lot of randomness there. So... Um, I think this is the first clue that the the green, you know, uh, dots here, the the beryllium, lanthanum, uranium enriched spherules, are probably from our solar system mm -hmm. and probably from Earth. Um, another hint is the morphology. The morphology yes. of the spherules is that they, um, yeah, like this one, S twenty one, which was plotted on that graph. This is three spherules. This is not a spheral. This is three spherules stuck together, and uh, you can you can see that morphology in a lot of their um, weird spherules, their D-type spherules that have low magnesium silicon ratios. That they're implying is a, an undiscovered uh, class of spherules with the strong implication that it came from this meteor, and that's why it's this undiscovered class. And uh, yeah, and a lot of them are are like compound, you yeah. know, many of them are stuck together, not spherical at all, whereas all of the micrometeorites are single and very spherical. 
uh, like the ones you were showing. Yeah, like these these would be sort of typical micrometeorites. So you can see how round they are because they were fully molten, and they were. Um, so it's like a shot drop thing. They used to drop shot to to make it go round, right? It's coming flying through the atmosphere, and it takes on this this rounded shape. Well, it's fully liquid, so it has surface tension. Yeah. It just yeah. falls itself into a, a sphere. Yeah. yeah. So that's another clue that those um, the other spherules that they're looking at were not completely molten. Hmm. They were. They would have um, formed a single sphere. Yeah. So this was partially molten. But also, it started off as many spherules stuck together, and just sticking stuff together is not something that that's going to happen when a meteor mm. goes through the atmosphere. Uh, they claimed at first it was. They've now um, uh, ignored that. But and they also want they wanted to make it seem like this morphology is indicative of another class of object. But what it tells you is that it didn't come from a meteor, because when material ablates off of a meteor, as they're claiming this meteor did it ablated as it came through the atmosphere and they they're hinting that this if it's from the meteor it was an ablation um the densities you know the distances between droplets are so low they don't stick together mm -hmm. they don't find each other and collide and stick together like this while partially molten it doesn't happen and um if that did happen for this meteor it would happen for all meteors and all mm -hmm. micrometeorites would be like this and they're not mm -hmm. So what this tells us is that this didn't come from a meteor. So if it's from our solar system and it didn't come from a meteor, <laughs> it's from Earth. I think I think Steve, when I was reading up, you can you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the, this blueberry bowl on Mars where you get these composite spherules, this is this is given as kind of strong evidence that these things kind of fuse together in a in a in a past watery environment that that, that maybe we're seeing some hints that those things that that Loeb has found have been on the ocean floor for for centuries perhaps is that is that accurate yeah this is kind of what i was thinking at first as well that uh what you're looking at here are these uh, hematite concretions that were found on mars and uh these were probably precipitated while they were at the bottom of a lake um and it's certainly possible for iron to um and hematite is made of iron it, it for it to precipitate uh out of the water and um i was i was working on that hypothesis for a long time because we we see for example on the bottom of the seafloor ferromanganese nodules mm -hmm. uh, a lot of metals precipitate if you give it enough time mm -hmm. um you know many many thousands of years um but and i think so you said they should they they show beryllium abundances as well that are consistent with with those ferromanganese nodules potentially. And, and they do, yeah. They're enriched in beryllium, they're enriched in uranium, um, they're enriched in um, lanthanum as, as well. Um, so I was working on that hypothesis for a while. And in fact, um, there's a lot of evidence that when you sit things out on earth for a while, they begin to look a lot like um, uh, chemically like their BLAU spherules, mm. you know, you tend to enrich um, everything. Uh, and that is because whether they're um, a meteorite weather, yeah, look at this graph, whether they're a meteorite weathering in the desert or a spheral precipitating on the bottom of the ocean or whatever, everything on Earth uh, on Earth's surface is a lot more like those spherules than any meteorite was. And so this graph, if you don't normalize to starting meteoritic material but you you normalize your abundances to upper continental crust which is some sort of global average of the earth's crust um you'll see that the deviations are are not as extreme so in fact like lanthanum um is is not weird at all um basically uh normalizing to this everything um would be in this green band let's say uh, if it were contamination from earth and um and the spherules are basically they're depleted in you know some major elements magnesium especially but um you know silicon and and uh alkalis um and they somewhat look enriched in beryllium still but this is a log plot they're enriched by a factor of 20 not mm -hmm. you know 3000 or something but they would look very normal in their lanthanum and uranium 
and uh, they look more Earth-like than mm. meteorite. That's all this graph is supposed to show. But, yeah. uh, but you've got three strong hints now from the fact that uh, they're they're not spherical; they're compound. Yeah. They have iron isotopes that are a dead ringer for Earth, and their compositions are much more Earth-like than. Um, than if you then if you normalize assuming that they came from space then yes then yeah yeah they would be very weird for something that came from space but they're looking more normal for something that mm. is from earth mm. and yet um they are depleted in certain elements here rubidium cesium mm. lead uh with respect to earth and especially the lead and cesium mm. um you know that's those are volatile elements so when you heat it up those are the first elements mm. to leave um, a, mar a melt or even a partial melt. And they do look partially molten. Um, they do have igneous textures. Mm. So all of the evidence is pointing to something from Earth that was melted mm. and, um, and heated. And that is the definition of a tectite. And in fact, one of the largest uh, producers of tectites in the world was an impact that took place uh, 788,000 years ago in that exact part of the world. So tectites are pieces of earth rock that were melted when an asteroid hit the earth's surface and they were flung into space and then came back to earth through the atmosphere after having been in space, but they are melted earth rock. And there was an event 780,000 years ago that collided somewhere probably off the coast of Vietnam, uh, between Vietnam and that island that's all orange, uh, called Hainan Island. Somewhere in there mm. is where the impact took place. And uh, tectites of various sizes, ranging from things you can hold in your hand all the way down to millimeter size or less, were distributed over this whole orange area. So the mm. orange areas are places where they have been found. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're on the ground in Australia. They're, they're found all over the Philippines. Yep. They've been found in, in most of those islands. They've even been found in Antarctica. So this and, likely expands a lot further, but it's just where, where they've been discovered so far. Yes, it could extend further, but those are where they've been discovered so far. And significantly, that orange, um, sorry, that purple star is in the region where um, they've been found. And if you were to actually um, look further on the map there uh, and draw a line from the impact near that Hainan Island, past the Philippines, through the, or through the purple star, um, you would find actually there's some deep sea cores beyond the map that um, right. where they've been found. And so the purple star is sort of in the zone of fire. Um, it's definitely in the splash zone. And this is a place where you would expect quite a lot of tectites from this event. And uh, in other places in the Indian Ocean, they're only buried in 15 centimeters of sediment. Um, you know, it happened 780,000 years ago, so you expect a lot of sediment uh, near coasts, but uh, in, and in most of Southeast Asia, it's, you know, these tectites are found buried in a few meters of soil, but on the bottom of the seafloor, there's so little sediment that um, they've been found in the upper nose 15 centimeters, so that would also be what you'd expect in, um, in that region where they searched. You'd expect to see a lot of tectites tides uh, still accessible within the top tens of centimeters of the surface of, of the seabed. And in fact, when you do the numbers on what fraction of the spherules that they found in the location should be tectites from this event, I got exactly 22%. It, it, <laughs> it's, um, it's amazing that uh, an estimate came out so closely to the fraction of D-type spherules that they so, found. So again, you're not saying definitely this is exactly you know we can be certain these are all tectites and the numbers are exactly perfect but this is a reasonable alternate hypothesis for where these things are coming from and it's one that hasn't been ruled out before we jump to aliens and you know extraterrestrial probes coming down and these kind of things yeah and or even that this is interstellar material yeah. period yeah. you know um yeah it's it's I would say right now this is a hypothesis, but it, I think you're going to find it's very compelling. 
Um, and it certainly was not ruled out and it wasn't even considered. There was a there was a couple of pushbacks on this. I'll just mention it while we're while we're here. You you've already kind of covered off a couple of them, I think. Um so load pushback that these would all be kind of buried because it was eight hundred thousand years ago, they'd be buried in huge amounts of sediment, but you've said they've been found in, in low levels of sediment, so we don't necessarily need to to revisit that. There was a comment from uh, a French uh, geoscientist, I think it's Pierre Rochette, who said um, not many of these uh, tectites are, are usually magnetic. So would it have been, would we have expected Loeb to have been able to pick up such a huge amount of these um, from the seafloor, particularly if you're saying it's kind of on the edge of this splash zone, even if this splash zone's not, you know, perfectly right. defined. Um, how Those do you respond good. to that? That um, yeah. That so the first one, by the way, um, no, we don't know what the sedimentation rate at this location was. If it is the same as in the Indian Ocean, then it would only be 15 centimeters. We don't know what the sedimentation rate was because uh, Loeb did not design an expedition or experiment or a sample collection that included this sort of ancillary data that is used to to answer these questions. They didn't collect any sediments from the seafloor so that they could compare to, they didn't make a control sample in another region. They did not uh, measure sedimentation rates. They did not do much. So um, so again, it's a, our, it's, a, it's a burden of proof issue again. Exactly. If he wants to argue that these would be buried, then prove it. But the other um, aspect, yeah, these tectites, it's not true that they're not magnetic. They are often magnetic. Uh, and they have been collected magnetically, and um, there's literature on this, but um, there would be a, a low efficiency. Um, and I think it's worth pointing out that, in fact, given the amount of um, area that they, they covered, uh, Loeb et al. did not actually recover that many spherules. They recovered 800 or so uh, spherules from a pretty large area that um, would have contained orders of magnitude more spherules and, and micrometeorites than they actually collected. So um, we don't know, again, because they didn't characterize this um, efficiency of their magnetic sled. Uh, we, don't, we don't know how deeply it's going into the sediment. We don't know how quickly it's picking up magnetic material. We, we don't know much about it, but it certainly looks like it was collecting everything with a pretty low efficiency. Um, but all they can do is say that out of all the stuff they recovered, um, yeah, there should have been a fraction that was um, uh, tectites. Fair enough. So is there um, is there a way to verify this hypothesis of yours? What what would we what would we like to see done, or is there are there any more tests or any more analysis we can do to maybe uh, zoom in on oh, that? Oh yeah. So absolutely, um, if you were to design further experiments, then what I would recommend is collecting um, uh, deep sea cores from there, from um, other nearby regions. If you were to draw a line between that purple star and the Philippines, hmm. you should find these exact same D-type spherules anywhere along that line, exactly. Hmm. And um, you know, if you didn't uh, find them in regions that had low sedimentation rates, then that would be um, a refutation of the hypothesis because they should be along that line from the impact. Um, and uh, I'm sure that there are other other tests we can do on the spherules, although they have um, collected quite a lot of compositional data. But with the data we have in hand, without further experimentation, I think uh, a very reasonable thing to do is to just compare the compositions of the spherules with the compositions of other microtectites. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did in this, um, this uh, paper that you put up on the screen, which is something that I submitted a few weeks ago to the journal Meteoritics and Planetary Science. Yeah. And, um, and as you can see there, um, and it's in review at that journal right now. Yeah. But as you can see, yeah, it's a pretty good match, better than meteoritic material to uh, to Earth. But if you scroll down yeah. to figure four, you'll see that what I've done is I've compared the composition of one of their spherules, S21, to um, a microtectite that was found, yeah, in Antarctica. So this was a microtectite, a millimeter sized tectite from the same event that happened 788,000 years ago. And uh, these are normalized in the same way to meteoritic material. 
uh, there's some degree of passive enrichment. The orange uh, curve is the um, microtectite, and the blue curve is their spherule S21. The gray line is the difference. And as you can see, um, the blue spherule is enriched relative to the microtectite in iron, cobalt, nickel, uh, mm -hmm. chromium, zinc, basically metal. And it definitely is like half metal. And that is an unusual aspect of this. But except for the metal, it's very, 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 very similar. So that microtectite is enriched in lithium on the on the left. That's lithium and then beryllium. It's enriched to the exact same degree. In fact, if you were to look at this tectite and collect it from the bottom of the ocean, um, you know, Loba et al. would say, oh, look, that is enriched in beryllium and lanthanum, uranium maybe thorium, um, uh, maybe strontium, but those those are um, the things that it's mostly enriched in, beryllium, lanthanum, uranium. And uh, it, it's like identically enriched in those species. Uh, uh, both spherules are, are depleted in lead and cesium. Uh, the orange curve is actually hard to get accurately here. The cesium is exactly depleted to the same degree. And so that indicates that these these were both molten, um, so partially molten as they as they pass through the Earth's atmosphere uh, to be depleted in those volatile species. Uh, I want to draw people's attention to the curve to the right of the lanthanum there. So that whole series of elements from lanthanum through lutetium, those are the rare earth elements that are on the bottom of the periodic that's table. A, that's a hell of a lineup there. It's a hell of a lineup. And this yeah. is a log plot as well. I mean, on linear, it's probably like pretty much over the top of each other. Um, yeah. So the gray curve shows the difference and the right. difference is tens of percent, which yeah, is. So, this, so if there was curve. no difference, this one would be tracking along zero. This 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 gray right. line here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, rare earth elements chemically behave almost not quite, but almost identically. And so it's very hard to get differences in those species relative to each other. And for them to line up like this, um, you have to have the, the light rare earth elements from lanthanum through you know, like europium to, um, to be enriched, but the heavy rare earth elements to not be enriched. And they both have a negative europium anomaly. And these aspects are very hard to to get mm -hmm. and for them to both happen in the same thing is very convincing to geochemists. So there you go. You got lithium, beryllium, all the rare earths, including lanthanum, um, uranium, all enriched equally. You have lead and cesium, both depleted about equally. Uh, the S21 spherule is enriched in metal and that makes the the major elements a little mm. different but um and they're both depleted in magnesium um uh, they're de both depleted in silicon but it's hard to see on this graph but they're depleted in magnesium especially so except for the fact that uh the spherule is more depleted in magnesium and more enriched in iron and metals uh these are identical very very interesting right so um this is in review, so we'll see if it's equally convincing and compelling to um, cosmochemists. But generally speaking, um, this is a very compelling graph. Every every um, meteoritist as I've shown this to has like, well, yeah, that's what it is. You know, this is an example of a microtectite, just on the geochemical evidence alone. But then when you add in that it has iron isotopes indicative of Earth, in fact, it has the same iron isotopes that tectites do. And it has that morphology that tectites do that ablation spherules don't. Uh, everything is pointing to these being microtectites, and they're in they're in the splash zone of the largest producer <laughs> of tectites in um, in a geological record that we have. Very very interesting, Steve. Uh, another idea that was come up for potentially where these can these um, spherules might have come from was again a terrestrial origin, potentially um, contamination by uh, coal dust. So this was some work that was done by, um, is it Patricio Guiardo? Um, what did, what was their idea? So they seem to be suggesting that these spherules could be um, just normal spherules on the bottom of the ocean that have been infused by um, contamination by coal dust. So what are we, what are we looking at here and what's their potential right. alternate hypothesis as well? 
or more precisely, they are themselves coal ash. Uh, when when coal is burned, it's mostly carbon, and the carbon turns into carbon dioxide, unfortunately, um, when it's burned. But what you're left with are these millimeter-sized particles that have been enriched in the things that aren't carbon. Um, and so these would include um, uranium and iron and nickel and, and everything. Um, and in fact, uh, what Patricio found was a very um, interesting article from 1976 from a, <laughs> a researcher off the coast of Florida uh, trying to find micrometeorites and instead finding all of this coal ash. Uh, that has floated in from hundreds of miles away from coal plants. And uh, the article that he wrote in 1976 was a warning. Hey, guys, if you're looking for <laughs> uh, look out for coal ash. And uh, there is a database uh, that is maintained. Um, the coal qual? Hey, is that, is that the coal one? qual. I forget who does this. The U.S. Geological Survey, perhaps. But um of, of various types of coal ash that are found, you know, it depends if you're taking your coal from uh, the Southwest or you're taking from Pennsylvania or so forth, you get different types of coal ash. And there's always a range of um, concentrations of different elements. Uh, so for example, uranium in the bottom left curve there, um, this is a probability distribution. Mm. The most likely concentration is around 10 ppm yeah. parts per million. Sometimes it's 20, sometimes it's five, um, but somewhere in that range. And these are lobes, uh, yeah. enriched spherules, the green the green ticks, I guess, which Super seem five. to line up nicely with the, the kind of maximum probability uh, in these probability distributions. Yeah, exactly. Those five were the ones that were measured as of last fall. Now there's 12 um, that have been equally well measured. But of those five, yeah, they, you know, and you look at the beryllium and you look at the lanthanum, there's, there's nothing unusual about beryllium, lanthanum, uranium um, for these spherules or nickel, you know, and, and these are very different concentrations. One's 10, one's 100, you know, th these are uh, very different concentrations. And to have like the major elements like this all line up um, was very convincing that, uh, that could be what they're looking at as well. So, so again, we've got another hypothesis that this is very difficult, right, Steve, looking at the compositions to to rule out all of these possibilities and therefore only be left with interstellar material is a hell of a lot of work. And, and we're nowhere close to, 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 to reaching that standard. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's really hard. What um, what the papers by Jacobson and Loeb have done is they have compared to a number of things, um, but they're all igneous melts. You know, they're looking at lavas on Mars, and they're looking at lavas on the Moon. And because you're assuming already Earth. that you're out there in the in space, and you might not be. Yeah, they're assuming that they're looking at something that that came from um, a, a planet that's you know, and they're look, looking at um, elemental variations that are due to an igneous process. Um, because they, they see it's melted, although they said it was melted in the atmosphere. But anyway, they, they're, they're only comparing to a small number of things when you think about how many things there are to compare to. Uh, the Earth is a really big place. And if you really want to say <laughs> this is like nothing on Earth. Then the solar system's even bigger, power. Steve. They want it, they're going outside of the solar system. I mean, I mean this is even, <laughs> without even understanding the, the Earth. Never Leave that aside. Um, yeah. you know, we need well, to understand what's going on. The Earth is more complicated than the rest of the solar system in some sense. You know, we have a much more evolved crust. Mm -hmm. They make reference to this a lot, that uh, that these, these spherules must have come from a planet that had a core because they're lacking in the rhenium that would have gone into the core of uh, the planet. And they're not just simply igneous lavas, and they seem to have come from a highly evolved crust, which means not just that you have a mantle, that uh, crystallize, uh, or a basalt, where you take the upper part of the mantle, melt it, make sea, um, you know, the volcanic uh, lavas that you get in Hawaii and so forth. Mm -hmm. But then you have to take that, subduct it under a continent, have it come out as a volcano, end up making granites, sediment those, make a sandstone or something like that. That's a highly evolved crust. Sounds very they, earthy. Yeah, they keep saying, well, it's a planet with a core and it's a planet with a crust and it's highly evolved. <laughs> and it's like, what planet did you find them on? <laughs> yeah. 
Occam's, yeah. ra Occam's razor. So coal ash, because coal ultimately comes from um, basically organics in sandstone, you know, it's going to end up looking a lot like um, everything else on earth. Uh, it's it's going to have that very earthy signature that, that we've already established it has. So both um, the tectites of that event, the Australasian tectites, uh, that was an impact that fell into a sandstone 780,000 mm -hmm. years ago, and it melted mostly sandstone. And coal comes from sandstone. So we're basically saying the same thing. The, these fields look like they ultimately derive from sandstone. I'm saying they melt it when an impact happened and they went into space and landed. Patricio is suggesting maybe um, those sandstones were parts of coals and those coals got melted in a furnace and <laughs> you know deposited. It's kind of the same thing. Um, they're very similar stories in that respect. Um, in the end, on average, coal dust doesn't work for all the elements to explain all uh, the average mm -hmm. of um, it may yet be that some of the spherules are coal ash. Yeah. On average, it doesn't quite work because um, coal ash would bring in too much arsenic. It would bring in too much cadmium. Bring in nothing we should be breathing, by the way. You know, <laughs> it was a major killer of people. Mm -hmm. But would have too much arsenic and cadmium and a few other elements that don't quite match the spherules and the microtectite matches better than the coal ash, but we're both saying the same story. This is what you get when you melt earthy stuff, specifically kind of like sandstone, sedimentary rock stuff. So so again, these are reasonable alternate hypotheses which haven't been ruled out. Steve, we need to come they to the end on this. haven't even been considered. Well, that, yes. So sub subset of that, yes, exactly. So I need to let you go soon. So so what do you think, what, what would convince you on this? If, if Avi Loeb really wants to, to to come back and do the work and say, look, these are definitely interstellar. Where do you think he should be spending his time? What does he need to do to convince yourself and the community that he's really got some some interstellar material on his hands? Well, um, I would like to address a few of the things in the chain of custody. If you want to convince me that these are an unusual thing coming from a meteor rather than something else terrestrial or, or tectites, um, just go 100 kilometers away, you know, and find, find, uh, measure, you know, collect the same with the same rigor and uh, enthusiasm that you did in the one place. See if you find the same thing in another place. And if you find the same thing in another place, it's clearly not from a meteor, like forget about whether it's interstellar or not. It's not from that meteor. And that would be very definitive. And had they done a control sample, we wouldn't be arguing about this, but they did not design a methodology that included collecting an equal number of spherules from a very distant location. They just didn't. And um, because- I think they... there is some talk of going back now. I don't know how how far along or whether that's gonna happen, but I think there was some rumblings about going back and, and doing that. Hopefully that happens, I guess. My understanding is that they want to go off the coast of Portugal, where there's okay. a, a less convincing example of a right. uh, solar meteor, and repeat the same mistakes there. You have to look. Designing an experiment is hard. Doing control samples and placebos is hard. You're putting half of your effort into something you kind of think isn't going to pan out, hmm. but that's how science works. It's hard work. You do that. He was very, very convinced he knew exactly where to go and find something unusual. And his plan was to see something he didn't understand and claim that was, you know, something that uh, nobody understood. And that's not the case. So that's one thing you can do. Um, you can certainly measure isotopes of these spherules and see if they have an Earth-like signature or something mm -hmm. which is obviously not from Earth or our solar system. And they did measure iron isotopes at first. And now that uh, the answer is inconvenient, they have simply stopped talking about iron isotopes. It doesn't appear in their <laughs> research note or in the archive papers. And um, when I when I talked to the the poor student who gave the talk at LPSC because Stein Jacobson was ill and, and couldn't attend, um, uh, the student said, "Well, they've decided to to double check the iron isotope measurements." <laughs> <laughs> they looked pretty good to me. Okay. 
<laughs> well, we're not going to pile on. Yeah, we're not going to pile on the student because obviously, you know, no. it, it, I know you're not doing that at all. But um, yes, okay. <laughs> good, good stuff. So, so Steve, uh -oh. I need to let you go. So can we finish? Because yeah. I'm trying to be, you know, I'm trying to turn over a new leaf and be be less of a cynic, like you said, but have more, you know, more confidence, as you said. Can we can we finish on a positive message here? This this whole debacle, this whole discussion, at least it's brought more attention to your field, right? The the science of objects that fall to earth and that are collected from the seafloor. What can we can you give us a a nice positive message to finish on? All right. Um, I'm not sure the attention has been all good uh, because at the same time he brings attention to the field, he seems to disparage the people doing work in the field and the work that they do. However, but, yes, okay. With, good. Yeah, <laughs> good. But I'm I good. Think, You're fine. I'm glad you got that in there. However, good. I right. think that uh, we have not had examples previously of iron-rich microtectites. And I think it's it's simple to explain. One, very few tectites would have fallen into, uh, would have come from sandstones that have these iron-rich layers. These iron-rich layers in sandstones do exist in Southeast Asia and um, almost no other place where tectites were produced. So uh, it would have been something easy to miss. And if you'd seen a, an iron spheral, you might just say, well, that that's a an I-type micrometeorite that came from an iron meteorite and not analyzed it with the same um, you know, thoroughness that Stein Thompson did. I think they have inadvertently discovered a, a, a new type of microtectite. It's like the others, but more iron rich for sensible reasons. And we may learn something about where that uh, impact happened and uh, where the crater is, which still has not been found. So they may have inadvertently done some good science. <laughs> Excellent. Steve, thank you so much for taking um, the time today. I really, really appreciate it. It's, it's a really fascinating field. And, uh, you know, I invite more people to, to to learn a lot more about it. I will link up all of your papers and the work you've done on this down in the description so people can can read what you've been doing uh, on this and the commentary you've been, you've been putting forward on this. Um, there's also... Um, a really good write-up by Ethan Siegel that I'd like to to point people to. He's done a lovely write-up of this, which made it very, very easy to to um, get questions for you today because he's been very, very thorough in his coverage as well. So I want to flag that up. Um, but yeah, Steve, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, thank you for covering this and explaining this and, you know, doing the peer review on this because, you know, it's, at least it's clear a lot of the times certain people will push back and say, you know, this isn't being taken seriously. Loeb is asking the big questions, but it, it seems clear that the the community is taking this seriously and, and is looking at it with rigor. Yep, we are. Thank you very much. Thank you for um, your time and, and your good questions. Awesome. It's been a pleasure, Steve. I will let you go now and uh, let's touch base again soon, buddy. Okay. Bye-bye. Take care. Have a lovely weekend. Bye now. I want to know what you think, because you're the scholars of enlightenment that I do this for. So please take a moment, if you wish, to let me know down in the comment section. And if you like this video, please consider leaving a like, subscribing, setting up notifications, and sharing this video more widely. I can't tell you how much these simple actions help me out and how much I'd appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being scientific. Thanks for being bad.